Get it out of your face. Stomach acid. Just let me take a swig of this. To Just do. a sip. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's absinthe. I taste that little soupçon of licorice. <laughs> It's Mystery Maniacs. Mystery Maniacs is a comedy recap podcast dedicated to mystery TV. Each week, we dig into an episode of a show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we love. This week, Murdoch Mysteries, The Green Muse, Season 2, Episode 5, I Am Mark. I'm Sarah. Wow, I screwed that up a whole bunch of times. You got through it. I did, eventually. All right. Hey, okay. next Saturday. Yes. Maniac, Maniac Brainiac, Brainiac Midsummer, Midsummer Trivia, Trivia Bash. Bash. We did that well. 2 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be so much fun. I'm writing questions. They're tricksy. Yep. They're uh, good. Thank you very much for the people who helped out in the test this week. Yes, thank it you. Went, uh, it went surprisingly well, and uh, we're getting together everything ready for uh, the 2 p.m. bash. There's going to be prizes. There'll be prizes, and I'll let you know that we'll, we'll probably start at 2 p.m. with the questions, mm. but we'll probably open up the, the live recording a little bit earlier than that so yeah. everybody so we can answer any questions people have and yeah. everybody can get situated and all that great stuff and the place you want to start is our youtube channel you'll see yep. a, a video up there that's a live stream there'll be a link to the quiz tool right in the description or a qr code you can just take a picture of if you've got a laptop and a phone that you're using, it's going to be really easy to get in and have and lots of fun. I'll send an email out to the mailing list with all this information in it as well. Yep. Just a real quick one. It should be easy to do and it's fun to do. And uh, if you don't want to answer the questions, you don't have to. You can just hear our lovely voices yeah. and watch us. You can just watch. We'll be on camera. We will be on camera. Mm-hmm. Talking about the questions and all sorts of things like that. So it's going to be fun. There are easy ones. There are tough ones, and there are maniac-level questions. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, I'm scared. I don't know the answers to half the ones you've written already. I was like, oh, I don't know the answer. Oh, but, you know, like Jeopardy questions, there's usually like two kind of clues in the question to yeah. help you. I'm yeah, kinda, it's all multi- kind of doing that. So All multiple choice and all midsummer. Yes. That's all we're asking about. Midsummer, midsummer, midsummer. <laughs> Yes. So, so watch all of Midsummer. Yeah, all you got plenty of time. 135 episodes right. this week. Yeah. To then brush up. You'll be ready to go. Or you could just re listen to all the episodes of the podcast. Uh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Either way, go study. <laughs> it's, it's really important. Yeah. Speaking of the podcast, this is a spoiler podcast. So we give away everything. And if you let your kids drink absinthe and canoodle in the park, <laughs> they can watch the who, pod, who listen does to that? the podcast. Don't let your kids do that. Don't let your kids do that. Before we dive in, we have another exciting thing that's happening this week. Yes. Uh, in an attempt to do less in more time, I mean more and less time, I'm doing my Kickstarter this week for my new comic, Strange Ranger, which is an all-ages adventure comic set in a mysterious park. Yeah, it's a, a park ranger It's a park ranger adventure. story. A young woman has a new job as a park ranger and is overwhelmed with all the craziness it's that happens. It's not a normal park. Yes, with beautiful art by Janssen Carbonell. It's just oh, gorgeous. He's super talented. He is super talented. Anyhow, if you're if you're curious about that and you want to know more about it, you should check it out on Kickstarter. Yes. So, and there'll be links to that in all the social media and I'll put a link to it in the email that goes out about the Maniac Brainiac Midsummer Trivia Bash. So The Green Muse is really an episode in which you have to decide who is the worst person. I, I have a question also. When the killer is not necessarily the worst of the worst person in the episode, you know it's a challenge. Yes. Also, I have another question. What? Is this a kissing show? It is now. Wow. Kissing! There's, there's a lot of kissing. In all caps in my notes. Yes. Kissing! There's, Horizontal kissing! There's so much kissing. <laughs> there, there's no more flirting there is no like it's official it, it seems to me that it goes from from zero to a hundred very quickly it's all ruby's fault 
Yeah, it's all <laughs> Ruby's fault. And whatever and whatever boring accountant Julia was out with apparently makes Murdoch incredibly jealous. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. No more of this messing around. If you're going out with accountants, I've got to profess my love for you. Yes. I'm not going to lose you to some boring accountant. He doesn't really profess his love. He more Kisses. demonstrates his love. Hey, Biba. Murdoch and Julia in the park, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. They both have homes. I know he can't have guests, but I'm assuming she has a nice place to live. They could go there. She has a palatial estate, I'm sure. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. She's at least got her own apartment that's not in a boarding house. Yeah. She's richy rich. No. Let's two well-known individuals, you know, in in the local society maybe have sex in the park. Okay. We'll get to that. So Crabtree (laughs) can just show up because you know he's going to. Anyhow. We start out at a brothel. Let's we, let's go there instead. We start out at a brothel in No, it's the Weston Music the Academy. The Weston Music Society. Women. Academy. Clearly all of these young ladies are music students. Yes. Taking music lessons. I would assume there is a piano somewhere in it. There is. Remember she's playing it. Yes. Oh wait, it gets firebombed. But doesn't really do any damage. No. So they say that it produces more smoke than fire. Yeah. But when Eddie Weston is getting everybody out, several of the windows look as if there's fire behind them. I am stunned and that yet the it whole doesn't building even, doesn't burn It doesn't down. even singe the carpet. No, it doesn't even <laughs> singe the carpet. It's very It's strange. really a smoke bomb. Yeah. I guess, but boy, it sure does look like a conflagration from outside. It looks like the whole building is on fire from outside. Yeah. And they do such a good job of, uh, you're my kind of canoodling sweetheart, good time girl, but uh, I need to get out of here. Yeah. Looks on all the men. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, uh, I'm out of doors now. And I'm out of here. Yeah. Now. <laughs> So what's weird to me is when you enter into these situations, you suddenly become partners with all these other men, right? You're conspiracists together. If you go into this place, which is why these places don't work like this. They Mm -hmm. work much different. They're much more private. Yeah, because you would immediately go, oh, there's the mayor. I can frame him. Yeah. Because all I was doing was, oh, I didn't know. I was here for a music lesson. It's like worse than being in the Masons together. Together, yeah. You know, it's not a, you, you have a, a confederacy of secret. Yes. That clearly, if you're, if you are at all willing to be outed, if it won't hurt you too much for people to know that you've been there, you have a weapon now against everybody you've ever seen there. Yeah. And like, the judge, like. The judge is actually a good person. The judge is a good person, but would I would think that he would stay as private as possible because he doesn't want to interfere with his job. Because mm-hmm. he seems to be a moral person, as opposed to his child. Wow, something went wrong there. Okay, before we get to that, let's talk about Eddie. Eddie uh, Weston is a prostitute who runs a brothel, who Bar- uh, Barnaby, who Murdoch <laughs> clearly knows. Yes, because they've worked at, she, they've met in a previous case. Yes. Where he, he misjudged her. Yes. Or he, better, he also misjudged her. He says to Julia, meaning, I know you're misjudging her. Yes. <laughs> wow. There's just jealousy all over the place here. Okay. Let's be clear. If you and I work together and I walk in and you're talking to a madam quietly close together and you clearly know her. I'm going to have some questions. <laughs> I think so. I think it's fair for Julia <laughs> to have some questions. Well, our our listeners may have some questions too, because they might be going, I don't remember that episode. And it's because it takes place in the movies. Yeah. So there were three made for TV movies with- They're Pe- tight to the books. Peter Outerbridge as Murdoch. Yeah. Now we see Peter Outerbridge later on in a kind of cheeky, fun role with- There's some actor crossovers, but they don't play the same roles. They don't play the same roles. And in those movies, Colin Meany from Star Trek Next Generation plays- Bracken Reed. Bracken Reed. Because it has to be a ginger. That's the requirement. Any ginger actor will do, as long as they have a Scottish accent. Now, these are dark. Oh my gosh. They are serious. Yeah. They're They're, not fun. There is- an extreme amount of nakedness. There's in the no first one. inventions. There's no crabtree silliness. That yeah, it's 
it's tough for me to say, oh, you should go watch them because they are so different from Murdoch Mysteries. Now, they do. I watched this one this morning, the first one. Mm -hmm. Um, They do have the the dancing scenes. Yeah, but that doesn't make up for the lack of joviality. He does have a bike. (laughs) Oh, he's he's just like the show then. (laughs) He's um, a guy on a bike. <laughs> Flora Montgomery plays Etta Weston in the movie. Who? That's a Midsummer crossover. She was in King's Crystal as one of the mm-hmm. young daughters, and then Keely Hawes plays uh, Doctor Ogden in the movies. And you might know her from Ashes to Ashes. Yeah, Ashes to Ashes. There's many more. They're British actors. It's much more British than Canadian actors. Yeah, and like George isn't even in it. It's, no, they they. But uh, Helena Joy plays a uh, prostitute. And, no, she plays an incredibly rich woman. Oh, that's right. That's right. But um, I think you're getting crossed over because uh, Etta Weston is not an upper class lady who runs a brothel. In she, the movies. No, she is. Krista Bridges, who plays her, yeah. isn't in there. She's not in the movies. No. And in the movies, she's very, very poor. Hey, you want to know some funny euphemisms for brothels? Sure. Other than West the uh, Music Academy? Okay. Because, you know, if you're going to the brothel, you don't want to say, I'm going to the brothel. You've got to tell people you're going somewhere else, right? I remember I was dri- my dad and I were driving through a city at one point in time. It was Ottawa. And, like, there were streetwalkers. And I was like weirded out by it. You were little. I was little. And my dad just said, there are ladies waiting for the bus. (laughs) So you could call a brothel a bus stop? I guess so. Hey, let's go to the bus stop. So in later on in life, I began calling them ladies waiting for a bus where no bus comes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, in medieval uh, Germany, you just call them a Frau Haus. Frau Haus? It's just a lady house. Just a lady house. (laughs) Which I think... Could also be a convent, maybe. (laughs) Don't get those two confused. Though, nunnery is a euphemism for a brothel. It is. So it's all confusing. Yes. But they were also called all kinds of schools or academies. It could be a a leaping academy, a riding academy, um, a pushing school. (laughs) I learned to push. (laughs) Of course, you've probably heard knocking shop. So in Terry Pratchett books... And Ain't More Pork, I think I've mentioned this before, the prostitutes are called seamstresses because it's illegal to be a prostitute, so they just say they're seamstresses. Yes. And I always thought that was just a funny joke from Terry Pratchett, but turns out it's actually a reference to Seattle in the 1800s where that really is what they called themselves. Oh, really? There's this joke that there were like 500 seamstresses in Seattle, but only two sewing machines, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, it was a different kind of seamstress. Yeah, so you could say... um, I, yeah, I'm going to go visit the seamstress. Okay. My mother was a seamstress and my grandmother, but not that kind of seamstress. <laughs> they actually sewed, right? Yes, they actually sewed in a factory. So so the firebomb comes through the window. Everybody needs to get out. Nobody's seen Cora. She's dead in her room. She's yeah. been garroted. So a uh, Molotov cocktail is what this is. So it's a bottle with spirits in it. Or some kind of flammable fuel. Yep. With and a rag stuck in Rag stuck in it, and you light the rag, right? It's it's name Molotov comes the the these have been around forever, right? But they don't call them Molotovs as in soon the episode, as, right? As soon no, because they can't. Right. Uh, as soon as there's glass burnable liquids and a and a rag, you have these things. It's, yeah, it's not like it's an invention that would have been hard to come up with. But the Molotov cocktail comes, its name originates from a Soviet guy. In, Molotov, yeah, that sounds in, right. In thirteen, uh, the foreign minister of of the Soviet Union, because when nineteen thirty nine, because if you remember, the the uh, Russians tried to invade Finland with poor. Molotov cocktails. No, 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 no. <laughs> this Mo- is all the weapons we have. The Molotov cocktails were coming the other way from the Finns. Oh, right, because they uh, they used them as firebombs against them. So it was like a cheeky uh, kind of, um, it was a way they discredited Molotov. I wonder if they used Russian vodka. I would think that probably. That would show them. And hey, if you manage to put it out, you can drink it. Yes, absolutely. Not this one. No, Because this one's turpentine and toluene. Yes. Don't drink that. No. Don't even smell it. Well, so I, 
people forget that Finland and Soviet Union fought pretty nonstop. Well, they're not friends now. No, they're not friends now. But yeah, that's where it's from. Molotov cocktail. Eddie and, and Murdoch have met before. He calls her Eddie instead of Miss Weston. Yes. So it's clear that they have an acquaintanceship. In the movies. If which not are- a friendship. Also a naked show. They're also a kissing show because they kiss in the movies. Their first suspect is Arthur Webster, a painter who's obsessed with Cora. Yes. The garroted lady. Yes. Because he had to be kicked out the night before. Yes. Because he didn't want to leave. Yes. Now I have a question about this. Yes. We find out later that she domineered him. That's what he was into. Yes. She ordered him around, disciplined him. Yes. Couldn't she have just ordered him to leave and he would have gone? He would have. He was he seems to be completely submissive to her. She, she should say, Arthur, go home. No, she, she needs to say, Arthur, go to the botanist's house. <laughs> <laughs> because clearly they're roomies. Yeah. The botanist from Dinosaur Fever lives in the same place. They have the same garret dwellings. Yes. Yeah, as the studio. But she could have just said, go home, and he would have had to have done that, right? I mean, I think. I would think so. I don't know for sure. This is sensitive though, right? Because this is a very upper class brothel. And so the people in there, the customers are going to be important people in society. So automatically Brackenreed is concerned about, we got to keep this down low. Yes. If they're not a suspect, we don't need to be publicizing who was there. But I also think that that I I think Bracken Reed does that completely. But I also think that Bracken Reed knows that this lady takes care of the women who work for her Mm -hmm. and it's a safe place and they don't get police calls much because this is all behind closed doors. Because Eddie does a good job of running it. And Eddie does a good, like... He also, I think, kind of wants to protect her a little bit. Well, because he know, I, I'm i sure he knows what it could be like, mm-hmm. right? What a badly run brothel looks like yeah. and, and what those women have to endure. And so he knows that this is not a bad place. But he he looks at Murdoch's notebook and sees the list of people who were there. And he's yeah. like, whoa, don't let anybody get their hands on this. Yeah. All these people caught with their strides down. And Murdoch is like, strides? And he says, Bracken Reed says, trousers, pants, yes. put their pants down, caught with their pants down. Yes. But Bracken Reed is Scottish. Yes. And so- No, no, he's English. He's English, right. Sorry. Um, he's English. I couldn't find a definitive answer about when the Brits started calling underwear pants. So for but, our, <laughs> for our North American listener, <laughs> listeners- Their pants. In, in England, pants are, are underwear. underwear. Yes. Much like our dog- Our old dog, Fanny, caused everybody in England to (laughs) To giggle. Because it's a euphemism for female genitalia. Yes, but we didn't didn't name her for that reason. Didn't name her for that. So when they say pants, (laughs) caught with their pants down, they mean butt-ass naked. (laughs) Well, I think... I. I think he's. It, it means the same thing. It means that you're vulnerable yeah. in a way that is exposing, yes. right? Just as if you had to go to the bathroom in the woods and a deer came along and you, you couldn't run because yes. your pants are around your, your ankles, so you're vulnerable your, yes. and exposed. Your right? pantaloons. But when he said pants, because I've been caught in that so many times watching British TV and movies and books and stuff that when they say pants, I have to remind myself they mean underwear. I just started giggling to myself because it's like he's saying just their pants are down, meaning just your underwear is down. But not your not trousers. Not your trousers. Oh, I hate that. Oh like, my gosh. Like that's the, the worst. <laughs> like when the elastic blows out in your underwear oh. and it sags in your pants and <laughs> your bare butt touches your pants <laughs> yeah. oh it's the worst your trousers are in place but your underwear is oh. not it's so oh. awful oh. i don't know and then i just had this image it's like in my, your sheet it's, it's like in being in bed and your sheet feet touches, touches the, the mattress, be- the mattress. Because mattress. Of the sheet right yeah but i just had this image of all these fancy men running out of this place to get away They've pulled their pants up, but their underwear is sagging around <laughs> their knees. You know, it's hard to oh, run like that. I hate Any- that feeling. Anyway, <laughs> that was my own little mental joke that I couldn't get over with. Hey, let's shoehorn absinthe into this episode. <laughs> Just because, you know, Murdoch and Julia could never get together if they're not drunk. So the idea is that they had some absinthe, which has wormwood in it, that makes you hallucinate, but... 
they figure out later on that it was totally spiked. It had to be. Well, that's because though Webster is infatuated with Cora, she's actually in love with Judge Wilson, Mm -hmm. right? And the judge, though he denies it, was there the night before, but he can't remember anything. He sort of passed out, and when he woke up, she was dead. Yeah. So the absinthe is why he was unconscious like that, and why she was unconscious to be killed. Yeah. So there's no uh, fighting back. It's... You, you think you're going to hate Weston because he clearly lies. When yeah. Murdoch says, where were you? He's lying. Yes. It's it's a no-brainer, right? He's denying that he's been to the brothel. Wilson, not Weston. Sorry, Wilson. But as soon as he opens up about his relationship with her, you're like, oh. And? You're okay. You're like. But you think, oh, you're a grumpy old denier, Richie Judge jerk. I'm going to hate you. Oh, no, I don't. No, at the end of the episode, you feel nothing but pity for the judge. I feel bad for him. Like, yeah. he, he, he obviously, he lost his wife. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure he would say he missed her greatly. Yeah. He clearly has made mistakes raising his son. I would say that. <laughs> and he's in love with a prostitute. Like, well, his would, life is not going well. <laughs> I would say that he make he doesn't make excuses for his son. No. But he doesn't speak poorly of his son. But he also doesn't do what he needs to do to stop him, stop enabling his behavior. Yes. His, like, he doesn't cut him off. No. How old is the son, anyway? He's got to be 25 feels at least. like he's 35. It feels old like, enough to know better. It feels like the judge and the son are just a little too close in age. No, I don't think so. Uh, I felt that. The judge looks 60, son looks 25. He looks older than me? Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Right. Well, so the judge is not a jerk. He's a mistaken jerk. Yeah. His son is a jerk. And then in comes the next jerk. Mr. Beecher from the Temperance League. Okay, no one talks for Margaret except for Margaret. Yeah. I don't like that he talks for Margaret. Don't don't tell me what your wife says. Yes. But poor Bracken Reed, he, he dreads the Temperance League like nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind the whiskey he keeps in the decanter over on the sideboard and the bottle in his drawer and everything else. Well, his, and- his wife is like... Oh, the Temperance League. You should stop drinking. And I have to think, from what I know of temperance movements, that they could easily get taken over by sort of puritanical elements. Oh, yeah. Because they were against alcohol for a reason. It wasn't yeah. just, oh, well, it, you know, it's bad for your health. It no, was, the it's biggest, the devil's lick, devil's drink. The effect on families was the biggest thing. Yeah. So anything that had that negative effect yeah. on families was on their list. So brothels were certainly on their list. Yeah. There are thousands of members of the Temperance League. But Beecher should just wear a big sign that says, I'm a hypocrite. Yeah. How about you? <laughs> so, when the madam is like, you, sir, yes. are a hypocrite. He wants the brothel shut down. He wants everybody who is a client there to be arrested. He wants there to be no alcohol. And he's willing to blackmail and be sneaky and sly and put all kinds of pressure on Brackenreed. I've got no trouble making power responsible for what they're supposed to do. Yes. But Beecher is a slime. He is. He's he is the worst kind of hypocrite. Yeah. He is the... No, oh, and don't, he's the killer. Don't do as... Don't do what I say. No, I'm not going to do what I say, but you have to. You have to. Double standard guy. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just horrific. Speaking of slime, let's go to the morgue. Okay. We've got Cora on the slab. Okay. And Julia has her stomach contents in a glass. The actress who plays Cora does nothing but good dead body. The she whole does, episode. She does a great job. She doesn't have to be naked like people in the movie. Face like, down with the blood everywhere is not easy. With her eyes open. Yeah. She's doing good. And they pick her up and ev- yeah. like, she's fantastic. But Julia body. hands the stomach contents to Murdoch. And I thought he was going to drink it yeah, for a second. Yeah, was a little It's worried. in a glass and yep. he like puts it up to his nose to smell it. Like, <laughs> get it out of your face. It's stomach acid. <laughs> Just let me take a swig of this. Just know. a sip. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's absinthe. I taste that little soupçon of licorice. <laughs> but the son, Paul, has arrived at the station <sighs> with bloody clothes. I hate him as soon as he opens his mouth. I think they're completely aware right away that he's framing his father, too. Yeah, because... Okay, so the guy who plays Paul, his name is Matthew Edison, and I, I, if we had a best actor of the episode, I would give it to him because 
he is so good at being a bad actor. Yes. <laughs> right? Like yeah. to be an actor who then has to play a bad liar. Yes. It's got to be a challenge. You got to give off all these signs that you're lying. But not giving them off. Yeah. Trying not to. Yeah. And he does that so well because he's like, oh, well, I don't want to cause any problems. Well, but th- I found this in my dad's wardrobe. Here, bloody clothes. <laughs> There's really two of them because the judge also does it super well. In the first interrogation of the judge, he says nothing about the the music academy. He says nothing out towards at all, but you know he's lying. Yeah, you know he's denying it. Yeah. But man. <sighs> okay, so both her jugular and her arterial artery were cut. Yes. With the garrote. So basically every drop of blood in her body would have come out spray more or less it would have been really 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 bad yes so what does paul do he takes the bloody clothes and shoves them in a briefcase yeah like put them in a bag but why did the judge put them in his wardrobe in the first place he should know better okay this the judge woke up near a dead naked lady and there's a fire and he loves her and he loves her but when he gets home he makes the decision yeah. Well, now I think he, he's sad. He's think, shocked. He's I, scared. All of that. But he's also a judge. But I also uh, and he's got an asshole for a son. And <laughs> I wouldn't put it past the son to manufacture this evidence too. What? Steal his dad's nightshirt and take it over to the brothel and rub it on the bed? He can get blood other places. <laughs> Wherever Julia got all the vials of blood last time <laughs> to test. So. Cora also has scars from being somebody trying to garrot her before. Yes. And she's got lash whip scars yes. on her legs. And Murdoch says the thing. What? Sex play. Oh, Murdoch, don't say that. It's like your grandma saying that. Oh. Like, don't. <laughs> <laughs> but... They have it right here with Julia because Julia doesn't judge at all. She's seen everything. She just says, well, that's some things that happen. And, yeah. you know, some people like that. And to be fair, Murdoch sort of says it that way, too. Sort of. It's just we're, that, we're grossed out, not by that, but by Murdoch saying it. Oh, the whole production stops so he could say those two words together. <laughs> <laughs> so they're clearly like, listen up. Murdoch's about to say sex play here. He's going to say sex. But what we don't know is, is he's gonna five try, minutes later, he's going to try to have sex Let's play. get it on. <laughs> A little Barry White in the background. <laughs> Meanwhile, Paul has an electric car. Wait a minute. Murdoch does inventions. Let's put an electrical car in here. I looked up these cars because I really wanted to understand how you drive them. Because yeah. they have a stick. It's a stick, but it's kind of like a rudder on a boat. Yes. Right? And it's completely for speed. You push it forward to go faster. You push it back to slow down. I don't know how you steer. I don't know. You can't steer with that. Maybe there, if there's two of them, one's left and right and one's fast and And slow. And it is true that during this time, electric cars were created, built, maintained, and ran. Yes. The first patent for one was in uh, 1891. People will say in Iowa that the electric car industry was destroyed by the polluting car industry. I don't know any of that. I'm not going to go into that. But there were electric cars then. Well, I know one really awesome. Well, I know two really awesome things about early electric cars. Are you ready? Yes. So the one that he has, I'm not sure whether this is one invented by William Morrison or the second patent for one was by two guys named Salam and Morris in 1894. And their car has the best name. Okay. It's called the Electrobat. The Electrobat? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Is there a picture of it? It's just, it looks just like that one. Okay. They all look the same. They're just like okay. black carriages, but it's called the Electrobat. The Electrobat. Salam and Morris were more interested in the batteries than the cars, really. Yeah. The batteries were the big invention. Yeah. And they then sold their patent to a guy named Isaac Rice in New York, who started the the first big electric vehicle company, EVC is what it was called. Okay. In 
the early 1900s, like 1900 to 1910, they had 600 electric cabs in New York City. Wow. Alone. Yeah. They could go between 14 and 30 miles an hour, depending on the model, and they could go 50 miles on a charge. And again, this is what we said We've said in a number of episodes, this is all a desperate attempt to, to get deal rid of with horses, co- to deal with Horse the manure. pollution that was causing many problems. Yeah. So the the thing that prevented these EVs from taking taking off then was how limited the batteries were. Yeah. So if you have a cab company where the cabs can only go 50 miles before they need a charge, what do you do? What do you think they did? I don't know. They bought ice rinks where they, and I, I guess it's just ice rinks, ice arenas because they were open. I guess. I guess they were just available. So they bought these ice arenas and they made giant battery charging stations inside. And so you would bring your nearly dead cab into the arena. They would swap the batteries and you'd take off again. Oh, cool. So it was like a pit stop. Yeah. Swap the batteries. Off you go. That's And they would charge your old battery. And when that one ran out, you'd come back and... Oh, that's cool. That's quick. Yeah. It's amazing. That's super I don't know why it didn't take off more. Well, you know. It's a hassle. Gasoline. Big gas. If only they'd put more effort into better batteries... And it's totally expected for him to have this vehicle. It's a toy. It's a toy. And as soon as his dad is taken into custody just to be interviewed, he's like, all the money's mine. I'm going to start spending it. Yep. Because that car would have cost the equivalent of like 10 years salary. It was really expensive. First, I got to go to the hardware store and get the things to frame him. Oh. Well, before he does that. I don't have a centrifuge. (laughs) He says that like a hint to Bracken Reed. Like, yep. <laughs> well, I can't do it myself because I don't have a centrifuge. And Bracken Reed's like, too bad. Anyway, like he probably doesn't even know what it is. Like, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> like you can't build one. You have Shut enough up. crap in here all right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. In the meantime, poor Webster is dead. Yes. And he's he's hanged in his studio garret. Yes. And on one of his horrible paintings, this is the botanist. (laughs) Forgive me, Cora. He's not a botanist. He's a paleontologist. Paleontologist, yes. Yeah. He'd come in carrying a big bone. What's going on in here? Uh, It's this Forgive Me, Cora on one of the paintings. He's very blue. He is. (laughs) And Murdoch picks up on the subtleties of their weird relationship here. Well, I don't want to say weird. He's trying to understand. He picks up on the subtleties of their. Of the non traditional. The dynamic yeah. between the power dynamic in their relationship. And Webster gives it away very, I mean, he explains it very clearly. Yeah. I think he does a good job of, of explaining it concisely um, that Cora dominated him and that's what he wanted and she was in charge. Yep. Right? So he always called her Miss Devereaux. Yeah. So the fact that it says, forgive me, Cora, is like a big hint. Whoop, 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 whoop. whoop. Right? But then we have to go back to Romance Morgue. Yes. The flirty morgue. So, so Murdoch can. Actually, ask Julia out on a date. Yes, they could talk about all sorts of things, including because she just assumes. Yes, he's saying let's meet up later to talk about the case. Yes, she's like, I'm probably not going to have the results yet. And he's like, That's okay. We can talk about other things, including crab teeries, untidy blank blank. What do you think it is? Pants. <laughs> <laughs> Why would they talk about Crabtree's underwear? George has poopy drawers. <laughs> <laughs> why would Julia want to know about that? I don't know. And why would Murdoch oh know about it? He said sex play. I can't be expected to understand <laughs> what he's going to say next. You're just broken now, huh? Maybe they're talking about... His untidy desk? I think maybe maybe he eats out of his helmet or something. <laughs> his untidy eating habits. Yes. You would not believe what he's willing to eat. In later seasons, we see him eating things that you're like, <laughs> Oh my God. George, George, I don't care if it's a new fad. What are you doing? Maybe his handwriting is bad. Maybe. His untidy handwriting. His desk. Because, ooh, I'm all about that. Let's meet up later because I want to hear all about Crabtree's untidy <laughs> handwriting. I'm on the edge of my seat. Like never in my entire life I have I said, let's go out on a date and gossip about the people I work with. Yeah. Like <laughs> as a way to talk. It, it would be like if, if you said, well, we could talk about anything over dinner, like Holocaust, Ukrainian war. Um, my, my friend who you hardly know is messy. We could talk about that. Yeah. Um, like, 
wow, you persuaded me. Of course she says yes, though. Yes. She doesn't know. She thinks she's just going for for crab trees, untidy, whatever. Yeah. What she's really going to get is way better. Oh, yeah. Peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter jelly time. Oh, yeah, it's peanut butter jelly time. <laughs> Some folks on IMDb claim this is anachronistic, that they wouldn't have peanut butter and jelly, that it hadn't been invented yet. Well, it, at first you're kind of weirded out because she talks about the peanut butter and jelly, and you're like, did they go out for peanut butter and jelly? Is this a weird thing? Oh, no, they just had a picnic. So, Okay. And walked away from the picnic. So Murdoch made the picnic basket with the absinthe. He brought it. He knew he was bringing it. Yeah. Made the picnic basket. They go and they sit down and they eat in the picnic basket. I don't know. Let's say it's six o'clock. Eat their peanut butter jelly time. Eat their peanut butter jelly time. Go for a walk. Then they go for a walk and just leave their crap in the park. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and his hat. It's a different time. People didn't steal things back then. Oh, okay. And then they come back, and then it goes south because... They start drinking. While George has homework. And they keep <laughs> drinking. It's apparently George who for has... hours. Meanwhile, George is working. It's George who has homework this week. Don't talk about him being untidy when he's the one out really working. And he does a good job being a cop here. He does. He... He's undercover. He's undercover. He doesn't get found out. But also, Paul is incredibly stupid. Paul is super stupid. Put that stuff that I'm going to frame my father with in the back of my electric vehicle. Kid, don't break it. (laughs) They trap him, and it's so easy because he is so dumb. He is so incredible. Good news. We're going to be able to release your dad. We don't think he did it. All we've got to do is find out how this other suspect got the materials to create the bomb. Once we do that, it's all good. Your dad will be free. Aren't you happy? Yay, my dad's going to be released. Hmm. Like, he he has the look on his face. You've seen it on every five-year-old who immediately yes. gets a plan yes. to do something you're telling them not to do. He's so easy to read. Yeah. Goes straight to the hardware store, gets exactly what they've told him to get. Yeah. Brings, so, it, brings so it back, puts it in the garage. Incredibly stupid. So dumb. I'm glad he's dumb because if he wasn't, he'd be really dangerous. Okay. So let's get back to the let's get pissed part. Wow, they drink so much. They have like at least five glasses each. To drink that much absinthe is a lot. Yeah, it's hard liquor. I'm not going to say they're going to hallucinate, but they could easily black out. Mm -hmm. And I did, I I don't want to apply my modern... Male sensibilities to well, the Well, especially past since Murdoch doesn't show. drink. He can't have any kind of constitution for I'm it. I'm like, dude, you cannot be doing this. No. She is obviously tipsy. I'm surprised that they didn't find them both just unconscious on their picnic blanket. Yeah. <laughs> just passed out. But no. <laughs> They're kissing. <laughs> it's in all caps and it has a five exclamation points. And then my notes say, horizontal kissing. <laughs> Precautions. <laughs> We're going to have to wait for another time, Will, William, because we need precautions. Yes. And he's like, okay. Oh, you're <laughs> so modern. You're like, so birdy. It, yeah. <laughs> I love that he's so hung over the next day. It's <laughs> so problematic. I just like seeing Murdoch be human. Let's let Sainer, Sainer heads prevail. Also, she's drunk, dude. Yeah, well, so is he, I don't, yeah. It just doesn't excuse it. No. He needs to be like. We're both really drunk. This is not going to happen. Yes. Crabtree's been up all night trailing dummy. Yeah. And Murdoch's hung over. (laughs) And everybody seems to be doing everything to make Murdoch's headache worse. Yes. But Julia's fine. She's perky. Of course she is. (laughs) How is she so not hung over? She's got secret medicine. She's a doctor. She's got secret medicine. Paul says when he brings them to the evidence yes. that he was in the garage repairing a shuttlecock. Yes. You know what that is, right? It's a birdie for badminton. Yes. It's like a little ball with feathers on it yes. that all point one direction. Yes. That makes it fly straight, but kind of slow. Yes. Do you know? Did you know that there is an international shuttlecock federation? 
I would assume so, since badminton is it's an Olympic sport. No, and it's has, not a badminton federation. It's a shuttlecock federation. Okay, I realize that. They have quite the website, <laughs> the ISF. <laughs> okay. Markets International. It is. They have representatives all over the world. All over the world. Yes. The origin of the shuttlecock, though, is not badminton. Do they look down at those plastic, crappy badminton oh, things? Oh, I'm sure. That, that you get the ones that we had as kids? Yeah. Mine, I've never actually touched a shuttlecock that had a feather on it. No. They have a little plastic yeah, picket fence thing yeah. on the back. But the origin, the shuttlecocks are used in badminton, but that's not where they started. They actually started um, as part of a game in China that's over 2,000 years old that's like hacky sack. Oh, cool. Where you have to keep it up in the air, but you can't touch it with your hands. Oh, okay. And I saw one. It's funny because... These... There were hippies 2,000 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> no, the Seattle hippies adopted the ancient oh, Chinese okay. game. Okay. See. Thanks for explaining my joke. <laughs> not backwards like okay. that. Okay. No. Okay. But on the there are some questionable history sites out there who think they have the answers to everything, you know? Yeah. I found one that was explaining the origins of shuttlecocks and complete with illustrations that are supposedly from ancient Chinese manuscripts where people are like clearly playing a game. Yes. But in one of them, it was just a chicken. It wasn't a ball with feathers on it. It was just a so bird. Th that's the origin. And it looks like they're kicking a bird up in the air. Way to go kicking the bird. That seems like an easier game. Yeah. If you kick the bird, it's going to fly up, and then yeah. the next person just kicks it again. Is that why it's called birdie, too? <laughs> it's because it's got feathers on it. I know. Needless to say, the game never involved an actual bird no, getting kicked around. No, I cannot think it did. That'd be a stupid game. My notes say, never played with an actual bird. <laughs> This is really important. So the, the logic is that Paul didn't actually firebomb the brothel because if he had, he wouldn't have had to go out and buy the evidence. He would have already had it. I think they're being kind. I think they're being... <laughs> he's like, too dumb to have done it. He's too dumb to have thought up the word diversion, let alone created one. <laughs> yeah. He's lucky he's so dumb. Yes. Because he's a bad person. Yes. Like, just legitimately bad. He he knows his dad is innocent, and he is willing to put his dad, who is a good person yep. and has always been kind to him. Yes. He's willing to let him hang Yeah, so he can have money sooner. Even when he's not there, his dad still says, he's my son, I have to take care of him. He's, he's lucky his dad is a good person, because yes. he's not. He's not. Oh, Absolutely. So bad. Murdoch does the right thing here and doesn't sort of be like, oh, nothing happened. Like, he's like, good morning. Yeah. We're, like we're, we're official now. We're, he would have changed his Facebook status, I yes. think, to in a relationship. Yes. <laughs> if he had one. <laughs> Look, it's me and Julia kissing. Proof. More kissing show. <laughs> but he, when he's at the morgue to kiss her, he also brings some evidence. Yes. He brings the absinthe bottle from Cora's room. Yeah, in like a... An accordion folder. An accordion folder. Why would you carry evidence in an accordion folder? <laughs> Excuse me, I have a head in the briefcase here with like, it. Like, put it in a bag. Yeah. What? It's the weirdest way to carry evidence. Yeah, I don't it's understand. Weird. It's like, and, and that's one of those things where obviously on the set, they were like, stick it somewhere. Where, how would he carry it? He, uh, put it in an accordion folder. Well, he has a history of misuse of office supplies anyway. Remember, he built a diorama out he, of pencils. He does. He builds the diorama out of <laughs> he, he used all the pencils in the obvious yeah. in the office to build a diorama of a bank and a theater. <laughs> and he keeps pig parts in a filing cabinet, yes. so you know he is. A, he is a. He's bad on the office a, supply a budget. Rough dairy of pig parts. <laughs> well, Cora's laudanum uh, absinthe had laudanum in it, so no wonder so, they were yeah. unconscious. Like we drank the whole bottle, and we were just fooling around. They, <laughs> they were out, and out. <laughs> so obviously. Uh, and they, they find out that the bomb was kerosene and toluene. It's for rubber production, electroplating, and lubricating printing presses. 
It's not for lubricating. I'm either. sorry to do the um actually, but um actually toluene is not a lubricant. It's yeah. actually a solvent. Yeah. I have toluene in the garage, by the way. Oh, excellent. I use it to thin rubber cement. It works quite well. Well, don't build any fire bombs out of it. I'll try not to. Okay. I have turpentine. I have all the ingredients. Excellent. <laughs> I don't have any care. It's a little experiment that we're going to run. Don't be afraid. It's okay. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so then they're like, ha, printing press. Who prints something? We know somebody who prints something. Beecher. Yes. So it, it is, uh, they succumb to the, we're out of suspects in this episode. And it has to be somebody who's spoken words in this episode. Yes. So it's him. Yes. He, he, it must be somebody who we've already spoken to, excuse me, and we've ruled out these people. But Bracken Reed's face is like a kid on Christmas oh, morning. Oh, he is so pleased. He is so excited that it's Beecher. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when you find out that your bully got grounded, you're like, yes! <laughs> He's a jerk after all. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> I can feel superior to him. Awesome. Murdoch does another good thing here, but he goes to tell the judge that he thinks Cora's feelings were genuine. Mm -hmm. The resolution of this case with Beecher is kind of rushed. Well, Beecher goes, yeah, I did it. I'm a crazy person. Here's yeah. why I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bad person. I went too far. I didn't know I was capable of all that. I, yeah. Lock me up. He's killed before. Like he, It's going to be bad for the cause, don't you think? Yeah. The people at the temperance office are going to be like, we didn't really know him, right? Well, and <laughs> Mrs. Brackenridge would obviously say, well, I never liked him anyway. No, I knew he was a wrong one. Yes. Obviously. Eddie's going to go to Winnipeg and off open a coffee shop. And there is more kissing! <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's nice that Murdoch says he shouldn't have waited so long. So, yeah, so they, they play here. To confess here. his feelings. They, they play here because Murdoch says. Last night was a mistake. It shouldn't have happened. It was yeah. a mistake. And everybody goes. Oh. And then he goes, I shouldn't have waited so long. And everybody goes. Yay. Oh. <laughs> yep. The and end. I'm not the only one who lives in their head. They have more in common. Yeah. Let's have don't. another picnic with no green fairies. Or public copulation. Because I'm just craving that peanut butter and jelly. Give it to me. Like her top is undone. Yeah? Yeah. Well, the neckline is unbuttoned and his tie is off. Ooh la la. You could see her bra. Mm, she wouldn't have had a bra. No. But but camisole. You, you can see her camisole. But there's a whole bunch of whalebone and lacing and stuff under there. It's not like it's easy access. Well, there's, you know, you get She's a, still well covered You up. get a condom, it's on. <laughs> <laughs> like your clothes just melt away. If only... <laughs> But it's we spoil everything. They end up getting married eventually. It, yeah. it doesn't happen anytime soon. No, don't, worry don't worry about it. But eventually, and they have a child. So someday she's going to tell that child, on our first date, your dad made me peanut butter and jelly. Yep. <laughs> and ever since. In the park. PB&J, baby. Yep. It's got a special place. Yep. Makes feeding the kid kind of weird, doesn't I will it? <laughs> also, I will also mention that other than this episode, I don't believe this incident is ever spoken of again. No, like it never happened. <laughs> never happened. There was that one time we were in the park where we almost had sex. No, never. I don't, that, was the, um, that was the absinthe. Yes. Uh, yeah. Let's just say that. That's why I don't drink anymore, Julia. After the credits. Well, best corpse first. Oh, yeah, okay. So best corpse is clearly um, Cora. Oh, I disagree. Oh, you do? Yeah. I think Webster's a better corpse. Oh, I think Cora. They're moving her around. And but he's her, blue. He's blue, but uh, he's got this, the harness on clearly. And well, no. They really hung him. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not saying like he's that. cheating. <laughs> she clearly is really garroted and he's just got a harness on. <laughs> we can disagree. You can think Cora is the better corpse and I can think Webster's yep. the better corpse. That's okay. After the credits, the judge changes his will. Yes. For sure. For sure. I think Paul is going to have a little bit of splaining to do. Yeah. Plus, let's be honest, Crabtree, watch Paul for 24 hours. Oh, he committed another crime. Yeah. 
<laughs> like he's, he's gonna clear, do. He's clearly a very he's unethical clearly person. Clearly going to do something else. Yeah. He's going to get himself into trouble. Now, the judge may continue to make excuses for him for the rest of his life, and that's his prerogative. But I don't think the judge is going to be quite so lenient on him now. No. I was like, okay, who would go to Winnipeg? (laughs) Not that Winnipeg is a bad place, but you have to have a reason to go to Winnipeg. It's a long way, too, isn't it? It, From Toronto? Probably eight hours on the train, eight, yeah. ten hours. I mean, it's not like BC, but it's, no, no, it's no. far. And then I started thinking about prostitution in Winnipeg and <laughs> how it must really suck because it gets really cold there. Well, you do it inside. Well, yeah. Unless you're Julia and Murdoch, <laughs> you go inside where it's warm. So, <laughs> Well, the Temperance League will come back yeah. uh, without Beecher. Yeah. But they're not gone. Yeah, she's going to go uh, open a coffee shop. I, I'm glad that Eddie doesn't come back because she looks so much like Miss Pencil. I get him kind of confused. Yeah, I I realized seeing this that I confused Miss Pencil and her too. Mm-hmm. Like in my mind, Miss Pencil was in this episode, which yeah. makes no sense no, at all. No, no, no. The psychic brothel would be a completely different place. <laughs> I know what you want. I, I know who's going to show up tonight. I can read your mind. <laughs> well. I don't know what accent that was. I don't either, but it's that pr- most, I would think, prostitutes can do that. It's pretty easy to do. Yes. Uh, you're not here to talk about office supplies, are you? Or crab trees untidy. <laughs> Something. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I did notice in the credits there was Jim Chad. Did you see him? No. In the credits? He is brothel patron. No, oh, poor guy. He's got first two first names. Yep, Jim Chad. Yep. All right, that is season two, episode five, the Green Muse. So what you're gonna do is look at your email this week or our social media stuff, and we'll post it everywhere. Because you can't miss the Maniac Brainiac Midsummer Trivia Bash next Saturday. Next Saturday at two p.m. I'm super excited. I am going to have a great time. We're going to have prizes, and you don't have to like score the highest score to nope. win prizes. No, nope. there's We're prizes just for just do being there. Draws. Be some you don't even have draw. to play necessarily yeah. to get a prize. Yeah, and uh, it's going to be a good time. All you got to do is show up on the YouTube's and yep. and. Uh, Put join your, in. Put your name in the chat. Yep. Don't even have to like create a login for anything or anything. No. Like that. No, no. None no. of that stuff. Super, super easy. Yep. Super easy. We, but it is fun. Also, the, the people who did the testing said, yeah, that was really easy and it was fun. So <laughs> I'm glad you're selling it like that. Oh, and last, it's fun. Like, well, I, I think that was kind of assumed. <laughs> see, Danish has broken me. So my my friend Danish, who I'm in the game group with, hates trivia. Yeah. And he also hates trivia with me because he knows I would win. Yeah. So we never play any trivia games in the game group. Mm-hmm. And he, he just, he refuses to play any trivia ever. Well, this is different. Yeah. We're all maniacs about... Well, and I'm running it, so I'm not playing. That's true. Because I would win if I was one. Oh, uh, I don't think so. Maybe. You said you can't even answer the questions <sighs> I've written already. They're tough. <laughs> They're not that hard. No. There's questions for everybody. Yes. Every level of m- maniacalness. Yes. Is that a word? I, I guess so. It is now. Yes. So we will see you next Saturday. We hope lots and lots of you will join us. There's room for everybody. Yes, and then we're going to take two weeks off which means we will return on August 21st with episode uh, six of Murdoch, Shades of Grey. All right, we'll see you then. Bye, Maniacs. Bye, Maniacs. Each week we dig into an episode of the show. Each week we dig 